All right, let's talk about psychology of the seller. Yeah, the psychology of the seller. Uh, I'll just start out with saying, hey, you, you, uh, a couple of you guys are already enrolled in Flip That Contract train, Wholesale Training Program. Uh, I know at least three of you are. Uh, and the point of tonight is for us to give you a bit of a sample of what it is we're doing in the program and uh, some of the exclusive content that you get and the big difference between George and myself because thing that we feel like we have a big difference over other trainers, mentors, speakers, etc., is that we are actively buying houses. Every day I am on the phone with the seller or someone I'm wholesaling to and you know, that, it keeps me at the cutting edge. So this is a house that I put under contract this weekend. I uh, put it under contract on uh, Sunday. I looked at the house on uh, Friday the 8th and I thought I'd just break down the psychology of a seller, where I got the deal from, how I marketed to the seller, the timelines involved, because it's really about having realistic expectations. Because if you, I first started marketing to this seller in March. So there, it, it is not, the good deals typically aren't the magic pill. Typically the good deals are the ones that People have a little bit of pain, emotional, it's either emotional, it's financial, it's mental, I mean, whatever it is. And then once you have to just try to make your message consistent and available at the time that they finally decide enough is enough. And you probably, I've been through it in my life, and you've probably all been through it in your life. Had this problem, whether, whether it's when you were 20 or 50. The point is we've all had these problems, and it, you might have been blessed and you haven't had yours yet, but we've all had these problems that we wanted to handle, wanted to get rid of, and we put it off because it's, it's one of my favorite books and you should read this, is, it's called Eat That Frog. And it talks about if you get up in the morning and you've got 15 things on your list of things you have to do that day, if one of them is eating a frog, eat it first. Get the hardest, most disgusting, most difficult task out of the way because otherwise, that frog on that plate in that box is sitting and hovering over your head and in the back of your mind all day. But sellers are a lot like that. So these sellers, that's time management. These sellers, the psychology of the sellers is this house that is part of a property. The house may not even be the property. The house may just be part of a property. So the point is to advertise and to get your message out there. Uh, Connection erratic. Okay, John, I'm going to do the best I can. So the point is to get your message out there. So this is the house 7315 Ashcrest I put under contract last week. What's that? Okay. The numbers. Comp the house at about 825. It's a 322 with a pool, Southwest Dallas. Uh, for those of you familiar with directions, it's southwest Dallas, right where Loop four, uh, Spur 408 comes off of Loop 12, and it just drops just south of I-20, and it turns into Clark Road, and it's right off of Clark Road is where this house is. You can look it up. Comped to 825, drove the comps. It's one of those neighborhoods that three years ago, this house was sold for 105, 106. Easy. Actually, three years ago, it was on tax value for over 100. But right now, the concentration of REOs and distressed properties in that neighborhood just killed the value. And the seller knew it, and we'll go over that in a second. Uh, I estimated the rehab at 15.5, and I always do and I always teach my students, estimate the rehab based on the worst case. If you were gonna, if I'm gonna flip it to someone, I'm gonna tell them it needs 15.5, I don't care if they're renting it or not. Because if I tell George it needs 15.5, he gets out there and he's going to rent it, and he thinks, hey, what's George think? This guy's pretty honest or pretty stupid. One or the other, I want to do business with. I'm going to get a good deal. I put the house on a contract for $35,000. Uh, I've got it on the wholesale market right now at 50. I had it, I had a verbal, and then I got an option check, and uh, then I was called Monday morning to uh, not cash that op option check because uh, they said it wasn't going to be any good. So, 
That happens. Um, it happens. I mean, that's the option checks for me. I always have them made out to my personal name, and I go to their bank and cash it. And we're going to talk about timelines later because, for me, that timeline, I mean, it's clock ticking. Every day that goes by, that this contract is worth less money to me, and it's worth more to me to get it gone so I don't have to close on it. Because my wife is my partner in life and in my business. She doesn't want a house in Southwest Africa. And she's part of all of my entities. So when it comes down, I say, hey, honey, we're going to have to go ahead and close on it. It's not a comfortable feeling in my house. So it's very financially and mentally beneficial to me to assign this house as quick as possible. And right now I'm in the driver's seat. What happens is a lot of the students, a lot of wholesalers, they put off the marketing. They say, no, nah, I got 30, wrote a 30 day contract. No need to hurry. And what happens is, before you know it, you put yourself in the exact situation the person was that sold it to you. You're now the motivated seller. Your back's against the wall. That closing date's there. Your earnest money's out. You're motivated. Whereas right now, I'm not motivated to assign that house this week. Next week, you know, that price is going to get down in the low 40s. The week after, yeah, we're going to be in the 30s. Just depends what I get. I mean, it's three, two, two, and pull. I'll, I'll probably end up assigning the house for about forty-seven. That's probably where I'll end up. And but that, and that's not. You're you say you have it under contract for thirty-five thousand, and you're saying kind of that you would and you've got it marketed for what fifty? Yeah. I mean, because really, you, truly, a, a, a rent investor is going to go in there. It, the, we're going to talk about this on the comps. The lease comps for this house are over 960 current. There are like 15 rent comps in recent in the last three months in that exact subdivision. Now a lot of people don't want to rent the pool. So I've got a bit of a challenge there. This has there's a bit of a challenge there, but uh, there's a lot of people I know that I've met that do owner financing, and they actually they don't care if it's a pool or not. That old pool liability thing, there's insurance for that. Bottom line is we're going to get into this later. This is really a chapter for another book. But when you're running comps, owner finance comps are determined a lot more by the monthly rents in the neighborhood than the actual retail sales. Because it's really about what someone will pay on a monthly basis for the property. So I've got some people looking at I bet you I end up around 43 to 47, somewhere in there. I won't, I, I won't get 50, but I've got 30 days to try. And I got it out there immediately. And you've got you've got some interest. I've got interest. I mean, uh, there's a showing uh, tomorrow at 11, and tomorrow we don't even have the lock box on it yet. We, I'm gonna talk about how I get them to do the lock box later. But, you know, at first I never even asked him for a key at the beginning because I didn't have the contract in hand. But what we did is we called him three or four times this week, setting up appointment after appointment after appointment. Like, oh, we're gonna have to get this guy in there and this guy in there. He's like, can I just give you a key? And you know, you're not gonna give it to anyone, are you? Rob, we're good. Okay, great. I'll meet you tomorrow at 11 with the extra key. Cool. So now I can show it when I want. Uh, I want to talk about the lead source. This house was a probate deal, which is off of the March probate list, which means the probate case was filed in February. Does that make sense, everyone? So it's, it, it's the March mailing, but I call it the February probate. Uh, it, it's just important to understand that you know, this case was filed, and there were like 120 or 130 filed that month. And uh, it was the March mailing, but it was the February filing. So I went ahead. I normally don't track all of this just because I know where I'm getting my leads from pretty much. But I wanted to show, I mean, this is just one of a, a, a whole bunch of houses, and I, I mean, as I look, what I, the reason I paused, I'm actually looking up that list to see if I got a call on any of those other houses, and I don't think I heard from any of those other sellers about their houses. Now, none of them sound familiar, so I don't think I heard from any of those other sellers. <laughs> Doesn't mean that I won't, or that it's not even a bad thing, because I might have spent total of $100 marketing to that whole page of leads and 
that for me. If I get one and make five grand on it, I mean, I'm not a math whiz, but isn't that like a 5,000% return? Uh, so, I want to talk about the actual timeline of that lead. Okay, so I got the list in March. It was Mr. Rob filed, got his paperwork, met with his attorney, and, and, and finalized his probate stuff, filed his probate documents and letters of testamentary in February this year. I got the list to me in March, and the way I get the list is I pay $187 a year to the Dallas County Auditor's Department, and I download off an FTP server every month that previous month's file. Here's the kicker. It just tells me the name of the person filing the, the case. And the case number. So then I have to go into Dallas CAD and search their name and look for their address and look for the mailing address, see if they own property. It might be the same person, it might not. Then I have to, I've got a guy that does this for me and it takes him a couple of weeks and I pay to type that list and get it all ready for me and put it in my, my format to make. The other option to get the probate list is you can pay FLS, foreclosure listing service. Uh, you guys charge 40, 40 to, 50 to $50 more. And that's like per county a year. Yeah. So but I'm just talking about Dallas County. Right. So I mean I pay over I pay over 15 bucks a month just for the access, and then I pay another guy, <laughs> but he helps me mail my letters, and that's just complicated that you don't he does other things for me too. So it just kind of comes down to what do you want to spend your time on? Yeah, I mean, how much time you have and what you want to spend on. I mean, if I didn't have Adam or Jack, I would just buy the list because y'all's list comes ready to upload and be mad. Right. So, well, we, we've got, uh, you know, we've got a lot of the, this that you research, that's what you're paying us to do. So, 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 so Judge, the early list means that it comes out eighty seven. No, no, it just means that um, there's been a probate case filed, and there's there's been you know a personal representative or a letters what is it a letters of testamentary, mm -hmm. and so it's just that there is a probate case in the courts, and we because when someone you know someone must have passed away. Yeah, and, and it could be. <coughs> that again? Matt, Matt, Matt. I mean, it could be Everett Martin Steen. That's the name of the deceased in the file. Everett could have passed away, and his wife, he, he may have had an estate of a certain size to where they had to probate the will and, and all the documents, and they may have no intention. And you'll get these calls. They will call you and say, take me off your list, you sorry yes. son of a gun. And the thing is, is the letter we're going to teach you guys, my letter that I always know probates, it doesn't say anything about, hey, I heard that Fred died, no. Uh, I heard Mr. Smith died and uh, I want to buy the house that he owned. You don't say that. I just Mine says, hey, uh, like this one was, this letter was addressed to Elizabeth Rock. Now I know she's dead. They filed paperwork in the court saying she's dead. So I know she's dead. But I'm not. I mail it to Elizabeth Rock. So it's kind of reverse psychology. You're mailing like Oh, really? And it says county records indicate you own the property at 123 Main Street, and I'd like to buy it. My wife and I buy houses, et cetera, et cetera. And, then they, and a lot of times people call, and, and this is where if you're a bad person, this really doesn't work. Okay. A good person is the nicest person you can do this to pull this off. Because when they call and say, you sent this letter to my mom, she recently died. What's the natural response? Sorry, here. And when you say that, they say, well, it's okay. I mean, I've gotten a lot of letters, but I do need to sell our house. I can help with it. So, hey, don't send the ambulance chaser letter or the hearse chaser letter in this, opinion, in this situation. But, I mean, hey, like I said, one out of 30 called me. So, the rest of us came like anything else. And when they call you and they're mad that you send them a letter, say, look, man, did you call Pizza Hut when they sent you a special on pizza? No, but I eat pizza every now and then. What about Dish Network? Well, I have cable. Do you call them? No. Man, I'm just do with mine what you did with theirs. Take me off your list. I'll get on it. And I hang up the phone and I don't bother taking them off the list. <laughs> They're not ever getting another letter from me. They get one letter. Because that's what I was... Yeah, Fred, go ahead. Can, can you get the name of the executive? 
his list has yes, the executor's yes. name. The executor is the person in charge, in charge. Of, of carrying through. You know, that's a lot of times like it's the decision the, maker. A lot of times it's one of the children. Sometimes it's an attorney. Uh, they're listed in the actual filing. See, George's company or George's dad's company, they actually pull the filings themselves, so they get the executor and the executor's address. I just get the list of the filings and who filed them. So why don't we who all got what, what, What's the takeaway from that? <laughs> there you go. See, did y'all yeah. hear that in the front yeah. valley team? I don't know. I mean, I want to be able to be executor. We're not getting let's, let's just all you see kind of say you got to get yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He told me to say that. <laughs> Did you get a, no, it, is, you I got a Jimmy Chong guy out there for you. It's got your name on it. I want you to ask who has your list. Right? We have your list. Okay, there you, you go. There you go, you right. Three. So three. on the but next page, I could just go check your No, then it's a professional. You send a whole different letter to the executive. You said yes. a professional letter, professional to professional. Yes. Mr. Executor, I understand that you have to, because you don't say things like, hey, someone died and you're handling it, because the executor could very well be the son. Yeah. And you don't want to rub him the wrong way. I mean, this guy was a Dallas police officer and missing persons. I mean, you know, you well, got to be careful. He knows people. <coughs> All right, so here's the timeline. I sent him a letter in March. That's it. No more letters. Letters are expensive. Let, let, I send my probate letters are on a resume stock. You know, it's a cotton stock. It's more expensive. Cotton stock envelopes. And when we fold them, I drop a business card inside. Because when they get that, it moves around. It's thicker. It's nicer. And we're going to talk about how that helps me in a minute. Now then, in April, he got a postcard from me. I didn't pull a new list. I didn't do any extra work. Everyone that was on that previous page got a postcard from me. If they called and told me to take them off my list, they got a postcard from me. It wasn't a letter. It wasn't a letter. It was this. These cost me 28 cents a piece to have delivered to mailboxes. I don't know about your time, but my time is worth a whole lot more than 28 cents to go into some spreadsheet or database, I'll just pass those around. I, I got plenty. Uh, my time worth a whole lot more time. To, oh, sorry, Valentine. Here you go. And you notice they're one sided. This is something we're going to teach in lead generation in the flip that contract because I have, for those of the people, that, the students that are actually ready to, or able to invest a little bit more money, they can. I buy these 20000 at a time. And for 20000 of these, it's 436 bucks. It's 2.18 cents a piece. And then I take them down, I have to go pick them up in Carrollton, and I have to drive them down to North Dallas. Well then, this side's blank. Well, I've got to print a different address on every one of them, right? So I'm already paying a printer to set this card up and to set up the type set. Well, I just had to print the return address and the bulk stamp on that. I save money by not paying one printer to print anything on this side because he's only printing one side. So lock, stock, and barrel with the bulk rate. Because see then, I've got other zip codes and we can't talk about those tonight, but I just add the two previous two months worth of probate onto the bottom of my monthly zip code mailers. So I get bulk rate on these. So it's 21 cent, 21 and a half cents postage on this size card, then plus all the tax and delivery and all that. I'm in their mailbox for less than 28 cents. And it's fully automated. So they got a postcard in April, they got a postcard in May. Now for all of y'all looking for that magic bullet, that silver bullet, the pill that you can just take and be Superman, most of you would have already shut off your phones and given up by July 6th. See, we got June, I mean, I mean it, I hadn't mailed this guy for two months before he called me. It's his mom's house. He's already had a dumpster of stuff taken out. He's been over there every weekend trying to figure out where to start, going through years of mom and dad's stuff. and just He's not ready to month, but he kept it because on my card, you'll never believe it. They, on the back of the card, it says, if you're not ready to sell yet, keep the card. People will tell you, oh, what said to keep the card, so I kept the card. Said, <laughs> okay. Right. right. Well, and so he calls me. 
on July 6th, and he asked for who? Anybody know? Jennifer. <laughs> he didn't call me first. He said he got over 20 letters, and the first person he called was Jennifer. And I said, well, my name's Tim. I'm her husband. We do this together. We put her picture on the card because she's prettier. Yeah. Everybody like a joke? <laughs> don't put your character. Uh, the point is, I, I don't try to hide it. Oh, let me get Jennifer and try to three-way her in. I said, you know, hey, we're, we work on it together, make a little joke out of it, and we bond. And the phone number on that postcard is a Google voice number. It automatically forwards to my cell phone, but if for some reason I'm on another line or whatever, I've got a tracking system built in Google Voice to where I know it texts me about every missed call, every voicemail, every received call, every incoming call, and when my phone rings, someone call that phone number. Y'all got cell phones, most of them didn't turn them off or put them on vibrate. <laughs> it ain't gonna take that long. What happens is when you call that phone number, I want every, yeah, a couple of you do it, that's cool. Because what will happen is I'm gonna ignore one of the calls and I'm gonna accept the other call. Now it's routing, it goes all the way like to Google in California and through the servers and all that. And I, George Ryan's calling. Did you call that number, George? Yeah. Is it ringing busy? That's yeah. not a good thing. Yeah. It doesn't do that most of the, So much for doing a demonstration. <laughs> the point is, it told me to wait. It told you to wait while I'm located? And then it told me to wait. Really? Well, okay, so. I guess it's a good thing I don't have a billboard on I-35, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not hoping for that many phone calls. I've never actually heard of that problem with Google Voice. That's interesting. That's new. Do what? That's new. I haven't had that problem. Yeah, I, I mean, I've... Hey, the chances of learning people are at the same time. Yeah. 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 Very, very minimal. What happens, though, what I like is if you miss a call, it, there's an app for the phone, and you can log on online, and it keeps track of all the different calls that you get. So it's easy to know that if they're on the Google Voice that they called about selling you a house. And that's what I like. Because it, it's kind of separation. Because even though I mean, this phone number is 214-607-1227, but when you call that phone number, you get this phone. So it allows me to have one phone, two numbers, and completely track and separate. So he calls me on July 6th. I say, hey, you know, this is Tim. I explained him the deal. He says, well, hang on a second. He goes through his paperwork. He said, "Well, I pulled three out of about twenty letters I got, twenty uh, things I got in the mail about selling the house. Well, I pulled your letter out too." I said, oh, "Okay, you know, it makes me feel good." And I said, and, and I ended up asking later why I pulled my letter out. He said, "Mine was the only one that wasn't just on plain white paper. It just it, it just felt more professional. I've got my business card in there. I mean, it cost me a little bit extra. I, I don't know what the cost per piece is on that." because I just know it's worth it, and I'm only going to do it once. It's not like I'm doing it every month to everyone on the list. That would get expensive. Uh, so I booked the appointment on the call. Very, very important. And what we're telling our students is if you can't be accessible on the phone, or at least to where you miss it, I'm not saying that, you know, yes, this isn't a leash, and you're not walking around like, you're going to miss a call, but once you identify it as a missed call, you got to be able to hurry up, get to it, and call them back. And then you got to call them back like every 20 or 30 minutes until they answer the phone because it, 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 it's a race. Because it, if they call and they don't get someone, guess what? He had three letters out of the pile, now there's four because I didn't answer the phone. But I got him on the first phone call and booked the appointment. Hadn't looked at any comps. He said it was in Southwest Dallas. I don't care. I don't know if it's in part of Southwest Dallas where I'm going to get shot at on my way there, or I don't know if it's going to be a great retail neighborhood. I don't care. I didn't have any other appointments for that Friday. I'm a wholesaler. I need to be out looking at houses and making offers. Hadn't looked at a house in a day or two. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go. So I set up the appointment. Now, if, if I looked it up and it was in Joppy, which if you don't know where Joppy is, if you ever hear that you're going to look at a house in Joppy, don't go. Okay? There's a two-lane road into Joppy and a two-lane road out, and they're the same. And you don't want to go in. It's off of I-45 over off of, uh, I don't even know the cross street, 310, yeah. That's Joppy. Fair Park isn't all that bad, but uh, if you go to Fair Park and look at houses, go between the hours of 9 and 1. <laughs> Partiers are still asleep 
<laughs> you go before nine, they may still be up. And you just want to watch out. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you just don't, I mean, you just watch yourself when I mean, you go in a certain neighborhood. Uh, but I booked the appointment, went, drove all the comps before the appointment. Got down there about an hour early, drove all the comps. I normally get down to a house about 15, 20 minutes early to a subdivision to, to get ready to drive the comps. But I hadn't looked in a, I don't know if I had ever been in this exact subdivision before. Now, I've been doing this 10 years. I bought a lot of houses, and which, to buy 1,000 houses, I've had to look at probably 10,000. So I've looked at a lot of houses and been in pretty much every subdivision in Dallas County. But I knew I hadn't been down there in a while. So I got down there about an hour early so I could really drive feel the impact of the foreclosure crisis. I noticed in the comps there were a bunch of REOs. The supply and demand was way out of whack. There were some sales figures that recommended that were suggesting in the 90s, and there were some suggesting in the 60s, and there really wasn't a whole bunch of difference. So I had to go, I, I think I printed like 20 sold comps and ended up finding three that I was okay with. Uh, and then I ended up rounding down just to be conservative. Now those neighborhoods, uh, I took uh, the same guy that went with me to this one that you're going to hear in a minute, went with me to, I had two appointments in Irving on Wednesday morning. He's helping me do audio for some of you guys. Uh, the people that are already students, the exclusive audio, we're just you know, getting more and more of it, that, and then Brian's editing it for us. Uh, but on Wednesday morning, the first one we went to, there were no good comps. I mean, none, because there were like three, house, three streets where the houses were built in the 60s. And the rest of the houses in the neighborhoods around were built in the 80s. It, it's right at, now, and there was a 3,000 square foot metal building in the back. And in the country, it would have been worth 20 grand, you know, on the sales price, but in the middle of Irving, by the dark track, I mean, I could buy it for a story, but, uh, So, but then the next house we went to, and, and I'm not trying to paint a picture, the reason I'm saying all this is I'm not trying to paint a picture that the foreclosure crisis is better than possible to comp a house. Because the next house in Irving that I went to that I'm pretty sure I'm going to get uh, on Wednesday, I had five good comps, five solid good comps. They were all three, two, two brick houses within five years, year built. All the square footage were between 1,000 and 1,400. None of them had pools. None of them had white elephant issues. None of them were on the corner of busy streets. I mean, it was one of those cakewalks to be a real estate investor because you drive in and you're like, okay, good comp, good comp, good comp. Hey, we're done. And, you know, you just you don't even have to pull them out because they're all... 80 to 84 dollars a foot and just easy to do so i got a verbal now i did not even try to get the contract executed on the spot and it's just about understanding and talking to the seller and understanding the parties at play because i knew he was the oldest brother i knew he was, i'm not even sure he's the oldest i knew he was the brother in charge i knew he was the executor but i knew he was going to have to clear it through his other brothers that kept saying we ought to this and we ought to that so there's no need in even trying to pressure him into signing because he's not going to be happy with it. He still has to talk to him, and a phone conversation isn't going to be enough. But what I did do is I left that house, went straight to the next house that I had to look at, which was back in Rockwall, then went to my office, and the first thing I did was email him the contract like I told him I was going to. The first thing I did, because you want to get it, and you call him and say, hey, can you try to pull it up? Friday, it's 4 o'clock, what are people thinking about doing? Getting out of the office. And this guy, he didn't even know his email address. And you're going to have that too. A lot of elderly sellers, they don't have email, they don't have fax machines. They're like, uh, email? No, I didn't buy one of them. It's like, <laughs> not really something you buy, but I understand. We can work on that. Would you like me to drop it back by? And you know, sometimes it's tedious. If you don't have and that's one of the things we talk about when you flip that contract, is carrying contracts with you. Because if, if he didn't have an email address, then I would have written out a contract and been like, let me leave it with you so you can show your brothers uh, because I don't want to drive back to downtown Dallas to drop off the contract at 5 o'clock on Friday. Uh, so I called him on Friday right after I emailed it. He said, yep, 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 I got it. He said, I said, okay, well, when are you going to send it back? I need to make sure you have the facts. And, oh, don't worry, you got my word. I'm selling to you. I said, okay, well, that's great, but I just want to, you know, be able to, I didn't tell him it's an e fax. I said, you know, I just need to be able to make sure that I can make, you know, get it. And, uh, okay. He said, it'll be tomorrow afternoon. I'm, I, my brothers and I are all going to get together tonight. I said, okay. So 
early. Saturday morning, I call, hey, Rob, Mr. Rob, Tim Harris, what time do you think you're going to be faxing back? Well, you know, my brother's canceled on me last night. we got to get together today. And I'm like, oh, man, don't lose this deal, Tim. Uh, so I follow up. And he's like, no. And he's like, you got my word, you got my word. Okay. I'll calm down. Uh, now, I'm not pushing you. I said, okay, well, you know, hey, look, I'm here to help you out. You just continue building the rapport every time you talk to me. Uh, but then he called me Sunday morning. He said, hey, I'm, I, I'm having trouble getting and this. always happens. Having trouble getting this. It's bringing busy. What do I do? 10 o'clock Sunday morning, right? You know, I got the kids running around. We're getting ready to go to church. Okay. So I called him back. I said, look, I just sent him test facts, and there's nothing wrong, or you dial on one. He goes, well, yeah, because I'm downtown. I said, look, don't have Metro numbers just don't dial one. Oh, oh, yeah, it's working. Okay. <laughs> You know, and, and so it's an APAX. I, I, I'm hitting send and receive, send and receive, send and receive. Just wait, you know, making sure that way I can open it up. So he's leaving the office too. I'm leaving the office. He's leaving the office. I mean, you know, I got to make sure I get this contract. Well, it came in. He goes, "Hey, uh, you wrote Duncanville as the city." Oh man! So I had to make him initial it. Adam did that. Actually. Uh, had to make him initial it, uh, and, and we got it fixed. And so I got it executed on Sunday. But then by Monday morning, I had finished my pop, and then there is a uh, there's a real estate group here around town that I have a, an agreement with. They get a small, exclusive uh, time on some of my properties, uh, which isn't really working out. We just started that last month, and it's not really working out on me. But, uh, Basically, you they have a database. Yeah. You give them first rights to blast out to their in buyers for right. their investor data because right. they want to make a little bit of money. And they pay a little bit more, so I'm able to right. say, okay, well, you get a 48 hour exclusive on this property. So that started on Monday. They brought someone to the table, it didn't quite work out. <coughs> so handshake agreements, and I finally got down to cutting the brass tax and saying, sign here, and I need the, the check. Well, I drove away, and it's like, well, I'm going to need that check back. So anyway, and I, I've already been telling Gord all about it. Anyway, it is what it is. Uh, I've got it out now, and uh, the nice thing is, is I did all the work on Monday morning. I did all the work. I did my pop, which is a property overview packet of what you use to present the properties. I had my video that I shot that day, and you're going to hear that in a second. I had my audio, I mean, I had my pictures. I had all my tax rolls and all my comps from when I looked at the house. It was all scanned in in a nice, neat package. So even when that other deal fell apart, it didn't matter to me. I got everything. I'd rather it fall apart if I had waited two weeks to give them their exclusive, and then it fell apart. Well, then I may be under the gun. But I got 30 days from the 10th, so you know we're good. We're we're we're, we're tracking. Hey, are there any questions? You guys, yeah. Three days from the 10th, and you were gonna buy the house. He's under contract to buy that house 30 days from. I am. And I'll, you know, what we tell our students is if you're not in the position or don't have the desire, the two are different. I mean, you may be in the position financially, but not the desire to buy certain houses. I have that thing. I get options. I put, uh, you know, options I pay for, and then options that I just sell. Hey, look, yeah. you know, I'm. And, here, and here's the other thing. A lot of times I get options when, like, this house, say I offer 35 and say, he, he says, look, I'm, I need 45. I can't sell this house for less than 45. If I feel like, one, someone else is going to give it to me, or B, you know, I can get four or five grand out of it, I'll sell it for 49. Yeah. I mean, if I can assign it for 49, 50,000, I mean, or even 48, if I really feel like I'm going to lose the deal, if I feel like he's not bluffing, I'll go ahead and put it under an option and say, look, you know, I need two weeks. I mean, if you want to sell for 35 right now, we'll go hard. Right. Where it's a done deal. But Rustin, I just I signed I'm signing a contract after tonight uh, with a seller in Fort Worth and I have 14 day option here. So you know, I mean I have the unrestricted right for 14 days. And what I'm gonna do is I've got it under contract, and I've got my pop together, and I'm going to start marketing it tomorrow um, for 13 days. And if I don't find anybody in the 13th day, pull the ripcord because I need to terminate my contract with the seller. 
And, and that's because it's higher, you know, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to find a buyer, so I, I've got to have that. Now, if, if she would have taken 15000 less, we'll, we'll waive the 14-day yeah. option period, and I will close on this because I know I'm going to find somebody. I feel very comfortable. So there's two different things. You want no option period, here's my price. Or, and you really don't want to present it that way, That, but I think all of you guys starting off, especially when your bank account might not be, you might not have the capability and you don't want to buy anything. You don't want to be put in that position, then you've got to write your contract where you have enough time to market the pop. What the property overview packet, which includes all of the stuff that we've talked about and that we're going to cover in module five. But we're going to upload the stuff so you can see it before five weeks from now. But and the thing is, is, you've got to understand is you're going to hear this audio in a minute of me making this offer. Your offer is not low enough. You don't feel uncomfortable. I mean, that's just the bottom line. I mean, there's going to be some uncomfortable moments. And if you feel Excuse greedy me. about it, you're offering too low. I mean, if you're thinking, yes, ma'am. I'm curious. Well, I guess I should hear the audio also, but I'm curious about how that conversation would go with a probate situation because we just went through this with my grandmother and um, and her house sold for half of what it sold for six weeks later after the investor you know rehabbed it and, right. and they're all mad because that was their whole inheritance right you know so how can you really keep integrity and talk to these people that you know this might be their their life's inheritance and you want to give them less than half of what you'll probably get you know what right. I mean? After it's, I don't know. I have a hard time being too honest sometimes. So. No, no. I mean, I mean, honesty is key. I mean, because it, it, I'll do this real quick. Let's go back to the numbers slide and let me break this down to you from a rehabber's perspective. Okay, in this neighborhood, if I pay thirty-five, I'm going to have about two thousand dollars in closing costs when I purchase the house. So I'm going to end it for thirty-seven. Someone that's great at math or has a pen and paper keep track of this. Well, watch. Pull up the top. This was a house that I'm looking to make on wrong, but this the tax value was what, 85? Yeah, the 82, 85, something like that. I'm gonna put 82. And it says how big is how big a 12 away? Alright, so I'm thinking ten dollars a square foot or thirteen. You said yourself 15. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's 10, <coughs> but I think the pool has uh, needs to be replastered so, so You're thinking so, $13 a square foot. Yeah. Because it is older, it does have a pool. You see, $10 is just a basic rehab. That's just paint, carpet, some fixtures. 13 that's when you're getting, there's a little bit more, maybe some texture. And, um, so I just we just have this right here. So 12 away, and then... What do you think is the estimated sales price? 80? Realistically, 79. Okay, so I'm going to put 80. Right? That's what the, after they rehab it, that's what it, they're going to they're going to yeah, sell I mean, it for. Yeah, I will put it on the market. 85? No. Oh. 79.9. Okay. And I sell mine for full price within a week. Then I'm going to put in 15000 for the estimated rehab. Cost. Which for me, George, in that neighborhood, I would probably spend about 175 because when I rehab a house personally, I like to make sure they sell. I rehab to sell, I don't rehab to own. I'll spend a couple grand extra during the rehab process, lower days on the market, lower home. Price. What do you have to make if you're gonna rehab? 18? A house like that, I gotta budget 15 because I don't know about vandalism. Uh, I mean, no, 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 I'm saying, what would you have to make, Tim, at the end of the day? 15, how much more? 15, okay. Oh. So you're putting in. Well, uh, hang on now. Your, your holding costs are a lot less than mine. So right, change that to four percent. And agent commissions. Oh, six. the holding costs. Yeah. Yeah, four six. Uh, and then the thing is, on the selling cost title on this house, you got to back out ten percent. Again, because you're going to have a six percent contribution. You're going to have. I mean, you're going to have. That's what I would. You know, to me, if I were going to rehab this house, Tim, yeah. that's what I would offer. Yeah. But look at the numbers. I mean, at the end of the day, after all of the agent commissions at 6%, the 
again, I'm a licensed agent, so it doesn't cost me but three. I've still got to pay the other agent. Uh, title company costs, four months of taxes, I'm going to hold on to this property, buy, closing, you know, because I'm paying. Well, that's going to be six months on this side. It, it's all risk reward. I mean, really what you see, when you see those higher discount percentages, it's typically on a house that's worth less and that needs more. Or is worth less, like the end retail value is going to be lower, and the, uh, the neighborhood may be a bit lesser quality. And you'll hear in the audio in a minute when I tell him, I say, look, your biggest problem is your comp, the comps here. He goes, oh, I know. I mean, but, but here's my thing is, when I change it to 85 and 15 as far as rehab, look at what I can pay. No. 46. So I went from 36 to 46. So I just don't just don't with 35. I mean, and, and, and that's the thing is this neighborhood. I mean, let's face it. There's burglar bars on the street, on, on some houses on the street. You lose a couple AC condensers, and you're eight grand in that you didn't expect, and that eight, that 15 comes down to less than you know nine. I mean, what? No, eight. That's seven. Uh, I mean, so it, it's. I mean, it's risk reward. Uh, so do you show them that paper with all your expenses? Yeah, I, we've got, I've got a presentation sheet that if I think I have a seller that's going to need some hand holding, I show them. Yeah, I show them. I'm know. not profiting. I'm not making. I'm buying it at 35, but I'm not making 25 thousand dollars, even though I sell it for 82 five. But I tell them, I say this ain't the TV show, okay? Yeah. I'm not buying it for 35, spending 15, going to be in it for 50, sell it for 80, and make 30 grand. Right, zero. Don't work that way, you know. On this house. I might, if you retail this house at the contract I bought it for, you might make fifteen or sixteen thousand. But I, I just nobody, they're, they're, I won't say nobody. Most rehabbers in this market right now aren't going to approach a house like that with a rehab strategy. The neighborhood at owner financing or buying. Yeah, the neighborhood's just too risky. It's good uh, because I mean. Here's the other thing that happens right now. This day and age, and one of the reasons that a lot of these offers are going down a lot is an appraiser might come in here and tell you 69. That's what it's worth. And then you turn around and you rebut the appraiser, and the next one may come in at 74. Guess what your new sales price is? The difference between 67 and 74. I mean, you're selling that house for 72 and change. And nothing you can do about it. So now, if you had vandalism and you got knocked down by the appraiser, now you're breaking even after six months worth of work. So it's all risk reward from a rehab. But that's all my module five. If everyone would try to be as quiet as possible, Brian is going to play track one. And these are 30 second tracks, Brian? Uh, they, they vary between 12 seconds to a minute and 11 seconds. Okay. And so maybe we'll play a track. Yeah, we'll play a track and then cover the track and then just. Okay. There we go. Track one. Track one. And what he just said is, we walked up and he, and he, he pointed at some siding. And he said, and I said, oh, this is that siding you were telling me about. Because one of the only positive things he had to say about the house on the phone during the initial phone call was, about the only good thing about the house is my mom paid to have this lifetime warranty siding put on. And so what I wanted to do was just acknowledge it. Because it's not the only thing he felt good about with the house. So I just acknowledged it. I pointed it out that I that I listened to him, that I I remembered it, that I noticed it, uh, and then uh, right when we walked in, he pointed at the tile floor of the entry and he said, "This is this is about one of the only things that's been updated. And we put it in a year or two ago." He said, "Well, I say we, but we paid someone." And, and I, I said, "Well, that's that's just the same as putting it in yourself because it costs a whole lot more." Just trying to make, I mean, because. It's emotional. He had to pay to keep his mom's house up. He had to update it. It made him feel good when he did it, and now he's thinking he wasted the money. So you try to make them feel better about their property. You don't try to make them feel worse about it. Right. Track two. So 
But he's talking about everything was green. And, and it's something that made him feel bad about it. He didn't like that you could see, they tried to put wallpaper in the kitchen. There's like an inch of green paint sticking up behind the wallpaper all the way around the kitchen and the countertops were still green. And so he was like, yeah, hey, you can see the green. I was like, everything was green back then. Because if you look at enough houses built in the 60s in Texas, you're going to understand that all the tiles are either green or pink. And, uh, you know, I pray to God none of y'all won't put that in a house you're remodeling ever, but uh, it's there on the houses you're going to buy and look at. And it's just, it's all about, that's a little bit of me showcasing some experience, but it's also telling them it's no big deal. Because it's not. I mean, heck, the walls can be orange. The bottom line is your budget's going to be to repaint them all, so it doesn't matter if they're orange or blue or green or white. Is it possible to turn it up a little bit? Uh, we can either turn it up or, Brian, why don't you just slide that back a little that way. Maybe put these on there? You, it wasn't. Well, maybe it was just the, hold on. Try this because that I think these speakers could plug that in right amplifier. Uh, George's big roundup speakers. Okay. Last yeah. Well, it was almost up. Okay. I'll just hold these and point it for you. Directional instruction. Yeah. Guys on the webinar, I know you really can't hear. I'm sorry. Track three. listen to this audio online and you guys I, I'll give you the link. Uh, the thing about I was talking about trust because in, we walked through the garage and there was a hole in the ceiling and you can see the trusses. And he was talking and a truss is a building system. Fox and Jacobs pretty much mass manufactured their houses. So they would for the there weren't rafters and ridges. It was trusses brought in on a uh, trust like a big triangle with a couple triangle supports in it and they basically built the walls and just set these things up on top of the walls, nailed them in and they were done. It wasn't building a roof. So the thing about a truss is what I was telling him and this is something I learned, George and I were talking about this earlier, you don't have to know this to start buying houses. You'll learn it. I mean I probably didn't know it until two or three hundred houses into my career and I, I actually can tell you I learned it at a house on Melody Lane in Forney because the thing is, is, an engineer will tell you, as long as you, you can remodel and move any wall you want in a house that's built on trusses, as long as you don't make any opening larger than a garage, the garage, any length of the garage, because the garage is always the longest opening, and that's what the trusses are engineered to support. And the same truss that's in the garage is used throughout the entire house, because they're just cheap. They, they, they figure out whatever the minimum is for that garage, and they mass manufacture them for the whole house, ship them out, stick them up, and put decking on top of them. So, in all Fox and Jacobs that were built in the 60s and 70s, all of them were built on trusses. Every one of them. Uh, but you don't have to understand, to know that to buy houses. But anything you do pick up when you're practicing on one, you always use that on the next to showcase some knowledge, expertise, and to, to just educate the seller. And, and, and it may, you may be talking about the AC because you know more about the AC, and you may not you may skip the trusses to start. You may know more. Are we going to turn on the air conditioner? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I was just thinking about this. Sweatshop around flip that contract book. <laughs> uh, the next track is about what I call attic gold. Some of the things I've found inside attics of houses that I've bought. I 
attic. When you started talking about the attic, he was telling me how many loads of stuff and things he kept finding in the attic. So I just wanted to tell a story to him about things I had found in the attic. And be, to let him know that his mom and dad aren't different. That everyone that's lived in a house for 40 years has an attic full of junk. It's impossible to find where everything has been stored. And then I went on to tell him about this one shotgun I found in a house in Carrollton. It was the dad's shotgun. It had been actually, I come to find out later, it had been left, passed down in the family. And the kids, after dad died, they couldn't find it. Well, the reason they couldn't find it is they didn't think like their dad. And they didn't look at his favorite place in the house, which was the detached garage behind the tool chest. That's where dad kept his shotgun. Because if those pumps were breaking in, I guess he needed to defend the tool chest. I don't know. <laughs> but the point is, I found it, and I actually took it to BMS Guns in Mesquite and had it blued and cleaned for him and took it to him to his work. And the guy cried in the parking lot. I mean, it cost me a couple hundred bucks, but I hope none of y'all are like this or, or, or the type that would keep something like that. You don't have to go to the extra expense of having it blued and cleaned for him, but. You know, you find something like that that's going to be sentimental to someone, give it back. It, 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 it's, I mean, just put yourself in their shoes. If you bought an estate and you found something that you think someone could have wanted, I mean, you know, that, 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 that grown man cried like a baby in the parking lot. Uh, so, next is Bill Up. That is just, we kind of talked a little bit about things, and I, I just wanted to say something nice about the house. I mean, because you don't need to be like a lot of these people teach you. You don't need to walk around slamming the house, so to speak. You don't need to see every crack, go, oh gosh, this house is falling apart. Yeah. You make people feel bad about it. It's a house. It's not, you know, like a, I don't know, a toy they bought. I mean, it's a house. You don't need to make them feel bad about it. So, I always, you know, it's got good bones, and that just means, you know, the house seems structurally sound, the roof looks good. It's got good bones. There's, you know, you, you tell them that, you build them up about the house, you build them up about, you're, you're being polite and courteous to them. Lou and wire. said I was asking him on the phone to have a new wire. Well, at different times, Adam would be stuck behind the guy. Okay. Yeah. And he had the mic pointed away. And yeah. First time. Yeah. I've got one. Now. What's that? Collar mic. Towards the stereo. Oh, yeah. What I'm doing here is on houses that were built in the late 60s, early 70s, you've got a potential to have aluminum wire. Uh, and so there were a couple open uh, light switches, so I actually had a flashlight with me, which I hope you always take a flashlight into a house with you. And I was just looking inside the junction box, and I could see where the aluminum wiring dropped down, and it was pigtail. So it's already pigtail, which a pigtail means that they took the aluminum wiring and basically put copper ends on it and, and used the copper to connect to the switches and the plugs. And the reason they do that is that the part of the aluminum wiring nearest to the plug or the switch were known to heat up. And when they heated up, the aluminum would expand and contract, and so it would de disconnect from uh, the actual switches and the plugs, and then you'd get sparks and crosses, and it would cause a fire. Uh, but pigtailing is a ex very acceptable practice. Uh, I won't rewire a house because it has aluminum wiring. I, I just won't do it. So uh, the next is we ought to. This is one of my favorite things to say to people.
that's you know one of the questions you talked about the estate selling for half the price. What happens in a lot of estate situations is this whole row of people may be heirs, and Brian may be the executive. Well, when Brian calls him and says, "Hey, you know, we got to you know figure out what to do about Mom's house, and we need to either fix it up or sell it." Well, they're all going to say, "Yeah, I think we ought to fix it up." Because what that means is they think Brian should take care of getting it fixed up, manage the money, meet the contractors, drive back and forth nonstop, and then they should all financially benefit, and he shouldn't be paying anything extra because he's the one that got picked as the executor. So we ought to, in a state situation, mean I think you should and we all should benefit. And, uh, and did you see how he responded? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. And because, I mean, because it's the truth. And, and when you tell an executor that, when you're meeting with them at a house, you've got bonding. They're, I mean, they're like, yes, thank I you. I just see Tim go like this. Yeah. I got it. I like, yeah. <laughs> got it. Yeah. I mean, but it's true. And you, I say that to every estate when there's more than one heir. I mean, because it's the truth. And they're feeling burdened. I mean, it's 110 degrees that day, and who's down there meeting the potential 18 people they want him to call? How many people do you feel like you've got a real good connection with, and it doesn't work? You know, that you're really like, man, I thought we were it, it really bonding, and, and then it comes down, and then it's, you know, is it? It happens a lot. I mean, but that happens a lot less than... I feel like I don't have a good connection with people, and then they call and say, oh, I'll, I'll save the house. That just doesn't happen often. I mean, most of the time, you know, you, you can walk out of the house and feel like, you know what, I think I'm going to get this. Because I think Joe and I really bonded. I think, I think my offer was fair. It may not be the best. And part of it is acknowledging that you may be able to get more. You know, I'm not. I don't put myself out, Joe, to be the highest price. I don't think I'm the lowest ever, but you know, you, you uh, rapport building is, is a huge deal because they feel like you understand where they're at and you're going to help take care of them, which is about the whole thing about don't make an offer that you don't feel very, not very, but you don't feel sure you're going to be able to perform on your offer because if you don't feel sure, then you need to make sure that you have adequate uh, CYA uh, clauses in there where you can explain to them, look, you know, if we, I have investor partners I have to bring in. If I can't get one of them to agree to this, I can't buy the house because of the price I'm paying. Because they're even going to say, okay, well, how do we find out if it's for sure or not? Or what price can you be for sure about? Because that's where sometimes they'll go down significant amounts of money for the for sure deal. Uh, and if you build a good enough report, George, one of the answers to that question is, They'll call you back and say, hey, Tim, I want to work with you, but you, know, you offer 67 and this other guy's a 70. Can you match it? Well, if you were low enough that you feel, a lot of times on the phone, you say, you know what? Let's do it. But sometimes it may be beyond your company. And you say, hey, look, let me get a couple contractors and some of my investor partners out there with me. Let me take a second look at it. I might be able to get that done. Then you call your buyer's list, you call some of your uh, hot investors that you know of, and you get them out there with you, and you call a foundation contractor, and if, if it needs foundation work, if you don't call them if it doesn't need foundation work. You may call a general contractor, and you put forth an effort to attempt to raise your price, and a lot of times you go through that exercise, and you can't raise your price, and you tell them, no, i got to be at 67, and uh, a lot of times they'll go ahead and sell you the house. They might be bluffing about the 70, or... They may just feel that much better about working, especially if it's being split five ways. Because I mean, what three grand divided by five isn't a whole bunch of money. Do you ever take uh, other investors out there and then they get into a negotiation? Yeah. With Never happen. How do you keep that from happening? Numbers being discussed between your investor. And uh, you, you tell the investor, you say, "Look, we're just there to look at the house. Meet me out in front before. Do not get there before this time." Don't talk to anyone. I'm, you're just looking at the house. We'll talk out. If you don't, it, it shouldn't happen that much if he doesn't even have it under contract. Right? I mean, you, you're talking about a situation where you don't even have it under contract. Oh, if I don't have it under contract, I only call people I know. Yeah. 
but you don't call, I wouldn't call Carol or Mo, I don't know, you know. <laughs> Once I have it under contract, it's got, you know. But like, yeah. that needs to be talked to them. If Rustin, you're coming over here to be the potential buyer, or I come over, I'm the end buyer, and you need to have that discussion is, look, this is a, you know, this is a situation where you do not discuss numbers in front of the seller, you and I have an agreement. That, you need to have that conversation with the end buyer, or excuse me, the end investor that, um, you know, I'm giving you the price, and if you have anything to say, let's walk through it, ask me the questions, I'll ask the seller. I would leave it and, and make sure that they understand that situation, especially if the seller's there. That's where it comes down to report too. I had this situation back in uh, April, May, house at 1225 West Redbird. I, uh, I got, there was a wreck there at the Zane Curve going down 35. I got hung up in it. The guy that I was meeting, he was coming from the south. He didn't get hung up in it. And he uh, he talked to the sellers, and he, he, he wasn't that proud of an individual. And he gave him his business card. I had a good rapport with Kathy. And I said, God, I know what he's talking about. He's just a realtor I work with. Don't worry about it. And I called the guy and just told him, I said, you're done, buddy. I called a couple of buddies of mine, and I, I, he's on the blacklist now. Uh, and, and you just do business like that. I mean, you just tell people you do business like that. So if you ever try to go around me, you're done. I will let everyone, I will scream. I will put more energy into making sure you don't buy from wholesalers than I do into wholesaling and stuff. Most people, just like with the seller, most investors have good intentions. And the ones that don't have good intentions that would actually try to go around you, you don't have to worry about them letting them last long. Yeah, Word gets out, it's work. small. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What's next? Family? Here we go. Wholesaling it, to, when I say fine, you put the house in the contract, you put yourself in the seller's shoes. 
when you're wholesome and you put yourself in the investor's shoes. My friend here, Joe, paid a lot of money for a lot of training. Then bought a house from a larger institutional wholesaler around town. That wholesaler only thought of their point of view and not of his. It sold him something that either that he wasn't ready to buy. And in turn, I think Joe got a better education out of that house <laughs> than he did, and it was actually cheaper than, no, okay, well, I didn't see the final spreadsheet, Joe. <laughs> uh, but the point is, you, you, if you operate your life in this business in a win-win mentality, you will be on the, win, on the winning side. And it's win-win when you're buying and win-win when you're wholesale. And win-win when you're working with other people. I mean, it's just... I used to make three to seven hundred dollars. Uh, there's a lady down on Oak Cliff named White a Couch. I just I would blast out her emails when I was 23, 24. I blast out her properties, and she paid me between three and five hundred dollars, three and seven hundred dollars every house I wholesale. I'd make like two grand a month just by using my buyers list and taking properties she had and putting A with B. And I I mean I didn't want to get greedy because if I got greedy, what would I have? She wouldn't have sent me the profits. So I might have been able to make two grand on one every four or five months instead of making two grand a month. So all oh, just about them. putting yourself in other people's shoes. So then you got comments. But up until now, I've been saying everything good. I haven't told him anything bad. I've told him possible. Considerations with the house about you know aluminum wiring. I talked about his situation, but now I say, hey, you know the only problem, the biggest problem you have is you know, I don't need to go into a big presentation. Now if he says, well, my sister's a realtor and she's already given me a CMA. You said, let's take a look. At it. So this is the beginning of me actually making sure he and I are on the same page just before we proceed. Yeah. But he said he understood it. So I know, okay, we're starting from an equal place here. And we both know it's a challenged retail market. The so next is bonding. I, I want to bond with him a little bit more because I just told him something bad. I don't want to go ahead and, you know, hit him in the knees with the offer. I want to back up a little bit. Did you say that? I'm standing there talking to him in the kitchen, and I've talked about the comps, and he sat down because he's uh, he's kind of preparing himself because I started saying bad things, so he's like, "Here we go," you know, <laughs> protect myself. Right. And I got my pistol in my booger. <laughs> but I looked over and I saw this. Uh, it was a Winchester 3030 gold plated <laughs> lever action rifle. Don't worry, what? It was in a case. So I wasn't worried. It was in a glass case, and it reminded me of a story from my childhood. Now, I'm not saying that you've got to have eaten from a family from East Texas where there were guns hung on the wall. There's other things in these houses that you're going to identify with. So basically, you went in there, he's sitting down. Yeah, if, I can re if I can replay this. You're I just told him there's yeah, no yeah. problem. So he goes and, and he's, he's like, like oh. you know, I mean, the biggest problem you have is there aren't any problems. And he's like, I understand. Yeah. And then you just kind of go, is that a Remington rifle? Right? Yeah, yeah. And you, you know, he did. then it's diversion. It, it is. I mean, I'm standing there, and I think he's like, yeah, yeah, you know. So you, and we talked about that for like two or three minutes, and y'all can listen to the whole audio. It's just, we talked so about it. You basically it. say something bad, and then you kind of, okay, let's get back but to But let's be friends. Come on. Yeah. We don't, I don't want you to be mad. You're a cop. Uh, so then we go to the next slide. Which I just talked a little bit about life.
So I, I knew he worked downtown because he called me uh, from his office phone number, and I tried to call it back on that number, and I got Cambridge Detective Rob with the missing person's department. And, and I remember that 214-621 was the downtown, like City Hall number because I called for trash. So hit back, George. Here's something interesting that I just picked up on. See, this is all looking at the house. I'm, I'm walking through the house and talking with him during all of this. We're not talking about the house necessarily. We're talking about just experiences and a little bit about the house. And Like when we were talking about We Otta, that's when we walked outside and looked at the pool in the backyard. We got back in, we walked around the rest of the house, and when, when I started talking about the comps was when he, we had seen the house. Now it's going to be time to talk about, you know, getting out of the mustard. So after I said something bad and he kind of withdrew, go to the next slide, then we talked about life. And so then, up till here, these next couple tracks, we'll just play them in sequence. It's all about, I want to know you as a person, and, I, and I let, you let him talk, you just got to learn to shut your mouth sometimes, which is hard for me. <laughs> I like to talk. But you ask him, hey, so you work downtown, you heard him just start going. You can't be in a hurry to go anywhere. That's why you book your appointments two hours apart. You've just got to be able to slow down and let him talk and let him feel like you're kind of becoming part of the family. Heck, he, at this point, he likes me better than his brothers because they're the ones telling him we out of this and we out of that. And I'm saying, man, I'm on your side. So go ahead and just play the next two, right? But just go ahead and play it. The <laughs> uh, point is, you gotta find you find something about what when you ask him about his life, you, you find something about his life, your life that you can share with him that will help you to bond on another level. He's a, he's in the law enforcement business. He's hearing me talk about military. The two are kind of similar. I mean, they're not. It's a lot harder to be in the military than to be in law enforcement. Let's get that straight. Uh, but no. so I mean the, the, the point is the only reason I brought up the Marine Corps at that point is I just listened to him for 45 minutes talking about being a detective so it's kind of you shared with me I shared with you now it's time for me to show you my respect for you this house and that's a bed he's going mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cause he's thinking about the nights he was on patrol that he had to go into these vacant houses that have been abandoned by some cruddy landlord 
And here he's probably, you know, the only cop on patrol in southeast Dallas sector. Like, <laughs> can't we just uncall this in? So, I mean, I, I want to just, it was from that morning. It's not something I made up. And I'm not saying that you have to have just been in a uh, house that had feces on the wall to bond with someone. You just got to find something in yourself or in your daily activity or something you saw on TV. Like this guy, if I had none of these, if I was Brian, yeah. I would have talked about one of these TV shows. I would have let him, I would have said, you know, that's always been neat to me. I wish someone would have encouraged me to get into law enforcement. I mean, tell me what it's really like. I would have asked him to keep, if I really had nothing to tell him. Actually, you would have talked to him about the Camino that was out front, the old El Camino. There you go. I mean, that's what you would have bonded with. A guy on Wednesday, he had a 26.2 marathon sticker on the back of his, of his car. I used to run marathons. That, he had no military ties whatsoever. We talked about that. <coughs> so, I must, don't think, well, I wasn't in the Marine Corps. I can't do that. You got to just look around when you get with suit. Yes, ma'am. Girls, you talk about your kids. Hey. Every, every girl, I'm single, I don't have any kids, but I got nieces, do you have any kids? Yeah. So tell me, do you have a boy or a girl? Yeah, you find something, especially if there's pictures on the wall, yep. you can always find something to talk about. Amen. So now, I've kind of told him where I'm coming from, I feel like we're buddies, let's set him up. <laughs> so what do you got? You know, that's based on what I see. That's what someone else would give you, actually. So, 
No, I mean, <laughs> so what's next? Delivery. keep their deed. Yeah. And they want to hand it to you. Like, what do I do with this? I don't need it. Title company's going to do a new one. Because they're thinking like a car. Like, they got to sign that deed over yeah. 10 years. Like, doesn't work that way. Not with a house. So, you know, I set up the delivery of, uh, and, and I made some commitments and it's important if you say if you say that you're going to call someone with an offer that day, if you say you're going to send them an offer, that, send them the contract that day, if you say you're going to send them a follow-up letter, if you say you're going to do something, you got to do it. And you got to do it when you say it because that's step one to cementing the deal. So if you say, I'm going to send you my offer in writing today, and you don't send it to tomorrow, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, well, this guy must not want the house. Or is he going to be late on everything? Or he must, I mean, what's his deal? If you say you're going to do it, do it. check in his hand and finally gets done distributing everything with his brothers and gets everything and he ain't going to want to come back to that house and it's just if he does and I wholesale it to Christy I'm going to call Christy and say hey I need to get the original seller back in take him to a walk through to mind and, and if I've had it now if I burned Christy and buried thing into the investor contract with her and all that she be like you can go to you know so just you know, always watch your reputation because you never know when you need it. Because I mean, I, I made this man a promise, and I'll, I will get him in that house. I got to kick the door in. I will get him back in that house one day if he asks. But the odds are less than one percent chance he'll ever want to go back in that house. Okay, next. Oh, you hear that? Yeah. Is something now? Close. Now I said since I'm so I can show my wife. Who thinks Jennifer wanted to see that video? <laughs> that video is so I can wholesale the house. That video is so that my end buyers can see what I've got. So I'm not telling you to lie to people, but what I'm telling you is sometimes the truth needs to be manipulated. Show it to your wife if you need to to make yourself feel better. I think I offered to show it to Jennifer, but she didn't. We'll see that. Uh, did you tell them that I wanted to see yeah. Quit telling them that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you, you need to shoot the while you're there. Crucial. Take the video, take the pictures while you're there the first time if you think you're going to get the house. Or if you think that when the contract si signing will not take place at the residence. Go ahead and say, I'm going to take some pictures from a record. I just, in case you call me back and got some questions about my offer, I just like to remember what I saw. Something to set yourself up to end up making money off the deal, because that's the ultimate goal. Go ahead.
knows that if I didn't say that, he knows that he's going to have, if his brother says they want the hutch, he's going to have to load the hutch, take the hutch to his brother, and then the guy's tired of it. And the other thing is the accessibility portion. Just make sure people understand they can call you with any question whatsoever. When you're leaving them, if they haven't signed a contract, and even if they have, make sure they understand they're not bothering you. Make sure they, you, they understand that this is what you do. Don't let them try to, A lot of the states, there's an executive. But in some states, what happens is say, uh, we're all cousins and our uncle dies and he leaves it to all of us. Well, a lot of times it's deeded in the, in the, in the uh, finalization of the will. It's actually deeded. We all have equal interest. So all three of us will have to sign it, the contract. Well, you don't want him trying to explain to him the paragraphs and the stuff in the contract. You know why? Yeah, it's like my 10-year-old teaching me out. It just ain't going to work. You can barely add and subtract. So let them know, hey, you, and it's also taking a little bit of responsibility off of the seller. Just, hey, look, come try. Have them call me. I will take care of it. That's me telling you. You don't have to do anything. Just let me handle it. I'm 7-Eleven. Anybody here ever been to 7-Eleven and bought a gallon of milk? Right? Expensive, isn't it? Now, it's cheaper if you go to Kroger, right? But what do you have to do at Kroger? Park in a two-acre parking lot, walk to the back of the store, and then stand in line behind 15, 20 feet. So, I'm like 7-Eleven. You're going to have a little bit less money in your wallet when you leave. But it's not going to take as long, and it's not a headache. That's what you tell people. You feel free to use that. Now, that's called a note. Now, you call, you call the realtor, that's Kroger. You may get some more money, but it ain't easy. So, uh, the next is a recap. It's said by a true investor who's white. It's, it's a realtor, yes. My wife's a realtor, and hey, it is what it is. I mean, well, you're not going to get as much because you got to do more, and I mean, you're going to get more. You will pay. I tell you. And, and don't try to lie to people. No, yeah, you'll get more. You want to call a realtor and you want to wait, you want to go through some inspections and some checklists and stuff, you'll get one. Because if they don't have the motivation to hurry up, they're probably not going to sell you. Two houses, 
bottom line is uh, she was going to come to closing with 13. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I can't do six to five. She's like, you know, I'm coming to, and I said, the most I can do is 58. She's like, no. And then 10 days later, she called and said, can you do the 58? 55. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I said, hey, and can you close at the end of the month? So you never know. She's going to come with, what, 20,000 to close just to get this deal done. Which is why I don't even ask people on the phone what they owe. I don't care. They may have refinanced six weeks ago and still have all the cash in the bank. And I tell people, don't try to be smarter than the system. And I mean, unless you're just so covered up in houses and so covered up in deals that you just really don't have the time. 